Good morning, everyone. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Okay, you all are even livelier than the first bunch. There we go. Um, so next up we have Jordan Wright doing his presentation. Uh, beforehand, just want to give a shout out to some more of our, our sponsors. The NSA, Exabeam, Accenture, Open Security, Titanium Level, uh, CyberSec Jobs, Denim Group, Alamo, ISSA, and Landmarks uh, Solutions. So with that, we'll kick it over to uh, Jordan. And one thing I forgot to add is if you're going to ask questions at the end, um, please raise your hand and one of us will pass you a mic so it can get captured onto the recording. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, all right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. So uh, it's great to see everyone here. I think this is my third B-Sides to come to here in San Antonio, and it seems like it gets so much bigger every single year. Uh, and but whenever I start to talk, especially here at B-Sides, I always want to call out the volunteers because this conference is really made and run by them, and they do such a great job. So can we give them a hand real quick? Awesome. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about unmasking data leaks, uh, and there's another kind of sub-theme that we're going to go into uh, that I'll talk about here in just a moment. Uh, real quick, my name is Jordan. Uh, my job is I'm a tech lead uh, on Duo Labs, which is the research arm of Duo Security, and I have to say now part of Cisco. Uh, and I also spend a lot of time developing open source software. So some of y'all may have seen stuff like GoFish. I, I'm the maintainer for that. Uh, I really enjoy spending my time developing software and giving it out to the community to use. Now, I talked about data leaks, but there's actually a different goal that I want everyone to get out of from today's talk. Uh, today, we're going to more broadly talk about research, security research. Whenever I got started in security research, it was really intimidating. It always felt like that's something for hackers who are better than me, who, who are more advanced than me. Uh, they're the ones who are kind of on the bleeding edge solving some of these problems. But the more I got plugged into it, the more I realized that's not the case. Security research is very accessible. It has a common pattern. And by following that pattern, we can make really big advances and, and come up with really great solutions. And that's what we're going to show today, using data leaks uh, as an example of that. But first, I want to give you a quick flashback. So in last con uh, of 2016, I gave a talk that was almost what you would consider the result of the process that we're going to talk about today. It gave an overview of data leaks in general, looking across different types of databases, how many are exposed what kinds of data are exposed, and what are we going to do about it. But today, we're going to look at more of the how, not just the what. Uh, and that's really beneficial to us because we can see that process from end to end. And that's what we talked about uh, at, at last con. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to really briefly touch on high-level goals of security research, uh, and then we're going to take a deep dive into data le leaks specifically, talking about the problem, how we can measure it, and then how we can try to solve it. And I'm a really brave person today because we're going to do some live coding, which is like the scariest thing that you can do as a speaker. But my goal is to really show you how accessible these types of, of research projects can be by doing it here on stage with everyone staring at me and praying to God it works. So that's what we're going to do towards the end of the talk, and then we'll wrap it up talking about prevention uh, at the very end. So this is the motto for my team. Disrupt, de-risk, and democratize. These are the core principles that we hold as a research team that applies to research more broadly. Our goal is to try to disrupt the current state of the art whenever it comes to security, measuring problems, solving problems, and identifying new problems. We try to, on our applied research side, de-risk a lot of things for our own business, try to identify trends, identify new directions the industry is going, and try to explore through those saying, hey, there's dragons over here, or this looks like it could be a good solution. 
And finally, one of the things that I hold most important is the idea of democratizing security. Uh, our goal whenever we do research is not to stand out and say, look at how smart we are, look at what we figured out. It is the opposite. It's not the, the end of a conversation, it's the start of one. We want to say, here's how we did this, here's where we got, and we're giving all the tools, all the research, all the findings, because we want you to take it to the next step. It's the goal of sharing it out with the community and solving problems together. And this is the three uh, kind of milestones whenever it comes to security research. You first want to identify a problem. Uh, try to figure out what you want to study. Then you can explore it even further. Is there something here that we can, that we can uh, explore, measure, solve? Uh, this could be uh, vulnerabilities that we find. And then at the very end, uh, one of the most important is recommending solutions. We're not there just to point out a problem and say, look, that thing is broken. It's very much to say, that's broken. Here's how we can fix it together. So let's take a look at data leaks using this methodology. Let's identify a problem first. So it wasn't too long ago we started seeing headlines like this pop up. I'm sure some of y'all may have seen these. I'm not going to read through each one. Uh, there's three, and you'll notice the numbers are not thousands, they're in millions, uh, which shows that it's pretty significant whenever these things happen. There's large numbers of sensitive data uh, being exposed. Those weren't the, uh, the only instances of that. Uh, far from it. Uh, and here's the last one. Uh, the important thing to notice, look at that date. That was yesterday. So this, this hasn't been solved yet. And those, those aren't all the headlines that I could find, and, and those are the ones that made headlines. So data leaks in general is not a solved problem, and it's very much a big problem. So we can say, we found a problem, <laughs> all right? So now let's take it to the next step. The, this is the, let's, let's try to hone in a little bit and try to classify what it is that we're looking at. Uh, whenever we talk about open databases and, and data leaks, what is it that we're, we're talking about? Some people may have heard MongoDB, some people may have heard Elasticsearch. These are different uh, new and upcoming data store kind of technologies. I say data store because I have to be careful. There, there's likely like some purists in the crowd who would say Elasticsearch is not a database, it's a document store. It's my talk. I can call the database. <laughs> so we can say Elasticsearch, we can say Cockroach, or, or, I'm sorry, uh, not CockroachDB though, that's probably one coming out soon. Um, CouchDB, uh, Rsync, uh, S3 buckets is not a traditional database, it's much more of a blob or a file store, I'm calling it a database. Uh, Redis, Memcache, all of your key value stores, there are so many opportunities for this data to be left exposed online. And it all stems from kind of the fundamental problem, right? It's it's, it's misconfigurations where you don't expect the data to be found or you don't know that it's even out there. And then people are able to stumble upon it as we'll see in just a moment. So now let's explore the problem a little bit. Let's talk about how we can actually find these. You know, we see these headlines. How, how are researchers going out and doing this? But first we have to remember, whenever we explore this, we, we have to be careful because our goal is remediation. My goal with this talk is not to go and make a new headline. My goal is to try to measure the problem and then try to reach out to the people affected by that problem to try to solve it. Uh, the headlines that I like to make are a researcher measured the problem and offered solutions. It's not, here's just another instance of, of data leaks being found. Okay, So we're gonna keep that in mind as we do the research and I'll talk about where that comes into play. So here's kind of the 101 of finding data leaks. We have a scanner that we're going to build uh, over on the left. We have all these services on the internet, all the IP addresses that are available out there on the internet. And right now we don't really know what's out there. We could start through a simple port scan. Uh, for this talk today, let's just use Elasticsearch as our example. Okay? We know that Elasticsearch listens on port 9200. We can look that up. So that's the port that we're going to scan for. We're just going to scan the entire internet. So we're going to start with the first service. It's going to say there's nothing there. That's fine. We'll move on to the next one. And all of a sudden we have a hit. There's a valid Elasticsearch instance listening on this host. The next step is to try to ask ourselves, okay, well, what, what types of data are there? Like, is this something that is meant to be left exposed? Or is this a data leak that we need to contact the owner and let them know this should be remediated? Uh, so, uh, let's say we just scanned the entire internet, this is what we came out with. It uh, looks like there is around seven, in our example, Elasticsearch instances, and we can move on to that next step. 
which is to ask, what kind of data is here? I use the kind of data very specifically because my goal is not to just say, let's go grab all the sensitive information that we can. It's very much the opposite. What's the least amount that I can do to say there's probably a problem and we can call it out and let the owner know, right? That's, that's more of the... That's the area of ethics that I like to I like to live in is try to be as privacy centric as possible while solving the problem. Okay. And we're going to do that for each and every instance. Let's say that first instance, we found nothing but data that was obviously meant to be public. Let's say the second instance, we have a hit. We see that there are sensitive information, maybe PII, maybe sensitive sens system information being stored, and we need to, uh, to remediate that. Okay, so we have a valid hit. That's kind of the 101. There's a different model that we can take these days because there's service providers out there that do the port scanning for us. Their job is to just scan the entire internet looking for common ports and services, storing that in a database, and then giving us an API that we can use to say, give me all the hosts that you found listening on port 9200. Okay. There's a few different scanning providers to choose from. Some of y'all may have heard of Shodan. Some of y'all may have heard of Census. Uh, there's Rapid7's Open Data Initiative, which is where they publish that for free. Uh, there's uh, Binary Edge, which is another uh, scanning provider. These all have pros and cons. Some of them are strictly commercial. Some of them have free tiers. The Open Data Initiative is purely open data. So which one fits your use case may differ. In the data, while you would expect it to be somewhat consistent, will differ, uh, but we'll just take, for example, just one from this talk, uh, we'll use census as an example, and we'll see that the techniques that we're doing are very agnostic to the scanning provider. It's all about just getting the data from them and using it, okay? So here's our game plan. Here's what we're gonna do today. Uh, we're gonna start by getting a list of hosts with open databases. We talked about Elasticsearch, that's gonna be the example that we use today. Now, for every host that we find, we want to determine if there's potentially sensitive information exposed. And if that's the case, just today, we're going to keep a record of that host. We'll dump them as a CSV, for example. And manually, we would go offline and try to find the owner, contact them for remediation. I wish there were more of an automatic process. It's very different. You can even see in some of the stories for this, uh, like a researcher found a database, but they weren't quite sure who it belonged to. That's a little bit trickier of a problem. But if we were on the researching end doing this as a, as a full project, we would try to find the owners, reach out, and see if we can get that remediated. Okay. So that's our game plan. Let's, uh, let's do some coding, and I really hope this works. So in my editor here, uh, I have an uh, uh, open VS Code instance, and I have kind of our game plan at the top, a little bit more specifically. We're going to start by getting open Elasticsearch instances from Census. Okay, I think I can actually, uh, let me see if I can expand this out a little bit. There we go. Is everyone able to see this okay, by the way? Oh, good, great. For every host that we get, <laughs> for every host that we get, uh, we want to, let me give you a quick background on Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch keeps documents and they index documents. These are held in an object called an index, and this index has a set of what they call, yes? Sorry, could you put that on mode? On which mode? Would you prefer night mode or light mode? I could I could try. Let's switch it and then we'll get a show of hands. Like and then we'll see kind of which people prefer because I've seen both work. Uh, let's see. View appearance. Uh, how do I change this thing? Yeah, someone help me here. Where are we looking? Is that settings? You think? Let's see. For the or maybe the help button. <laughs> maybe the help button. Uh, we may have to do that. Uh, Let's see. If we can't find a student, I may just have to move forward with this. Uh, is it okay if we just move forward with this? Is that all right? Okay. Awesome. And the good news is, all of the code that we're writing today, I'm going to release on GitHub after the fact. So, and the slides as well. So, if you see links on the slides, if you see things with, uh, you know, that are hyperlinked, the goal is not to have y'all click that from the audience. The goal is to give the slides later, and you can go look at those uh, those after the fact. 
Uh, so uh, Elasticsearch stores indexes. Each of these index holds a mapping. A mapping is a set of fields that are stored, let's say, uh, for a sensitive data store, username, password, uh, um, first name, last name kind of thing. And it stores the data type. So those are strings with this max length. Uh, and, and that's what we're interested in today. We want to see what's the IP address, which index is it stored in, for example, users, and then which properties are in that. Because that's a pretty good indication of whether or not there's likely sensitive information. And uh, at the very end, we could optionally get the number of records in each one of those indexes. You'll notice we're not pulling the data itself. Okay, we're, we're just starting with just the metadata about it because that gives us a good idea if there's a problem there or not while still letting them keep that data. Even though it is all publicly accessible, uh, we're choosing to draw that line um, where we can try to protect that privacy a little bit more. And we're gonna store everything in a CSV and, uh, and let's, let's get to it. So we're just gonna run through this game plan. Uh, let's start by getting the Elasticsearch instances from census, okay? Let's make a new function. We'll call it get instances. And what I've done, I've cheated just a little bit, okay? And I'm gonna be honest about this with y'all because I feel like this is a good place where we can be honest together. I'm, I'm not so brave so as to assume the Wi-Fi is gonna work for me up here, okay? So I've downloaded this data from Census and I've stored it offline and I've made a little helper class that wraps the normal Census API, giving me the offline data instead, okay? So the good news is, Here's what it looks like in production. If you do uh, from census.ipv4, import census, where's it at? Census IP, there it is, census IP4. This is what you would look like if you're doing this online with real data, all right? Here's the difference, there it is. That's the difference. So I try to keep it as close as possible <laughs> so that things still feel the same whenever we're writing the code, okay? Uh, so we have our census uh, uh, class available. Let's go ahead and make our API. We want to make this, and it says that we need, it's not going to show that, but uh, we need two things. We need our API ID and our API secret. These are given to us by census whenever we sign up and create an account. And for our example, it says if you want to use the offline version, just tell us you want to use offline. So we'll do that. Uh, offline and API secret is offline. I'll be able to type better whenever my fingers don't get as cold from nerves. Uh, so we have our API instance. Now let's query for host. Okay. Whenever it comes to census, we, it has a certain query language. Each of these scanning providers has their own language. I think I have census up here with their query syntax. And the thing that we're interested in looking at is something like this right here. It says you can specify a protocol's tag. You can give me a port and the expected protocol. Uh, I'll just let you know we're looking for 9200 in Elasticsearch is a valid query. So let's say API dot search and it asks for a query. So that's what we're going to give it. We're going to say protocols 9200 Elasticsearch. Okay, just like that. And that looks good. And that's going to give us a set of results. So for now, what we're going to do, we're going to say for every result, and let's just call it for instance, for every instance in our results, let's just print it out. Okay. Just make sure that we're doing a sanity check that I'm not going to get all the way through this talk and it's going to break uh, from the first step. Let's say we're going to run instances like that. And let's try to run it. Let's go to my terminal here. I know y'all can't see the prop, that's okay. Um, scanner, the PY. Awesome, look at that, we got some data. Uh, <laughs> thank God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. So this data that we're given back by census is really, for this particular endpoint, it's the metadata about an IP. We don't have any information about the Elasticsearch instances out there, just that there is this IP address, it is in Ireland, and it has an Elasticsearch instance available. So that already gives us half the way there. Like We saved ourselves from having to port scan the entire internet. That saves us some time, okay? So now let's take it to the next level. So we've done the first step. Now for every result, 
we want to use an Elasticsearch client to figure out what indexes are out there, what properties are they storing, and how many records are out there. That saves us, whenever we're doing our analysis, from saying, oh, you know, here's this user's index, but there's, there's no entries in it. So there's, we're not going to waste our time trying to follow up on that. Okay. So let's go ahead and make a new function. And for now, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to use a special Python keyword, yield. I know that's kind of a, a hidden gem. That means we're not going to collect all of them and return a big list. We're going to return them one by one. It saves a little bit of memory. Uh, so let's say we're going to get our indexes. Okay. And I'm going to say, let's give us an IP address because that's what we care about. And this function is going to connect to that Elasticsearch instance and give us the data that we care about. Okay. So I'm going to hop up to the top because I got to import Elasticsearch. In production, you would do this. You say from Elasticsearch, import Elasticsearch. For offline, I'm just doing this and that. Otherwise, the APIs, the, the, the arguments, all that stays the exact same. Okay. So let's make our little client. Let's say, let's just call it client. Offline Elasticsearch, and it says, I need a set of hosts. Who do you want to connect to? Uh, that's because typically if I'm doing this as a sysadmin, I may have a cluster of Elasticsearch hosts that I want to manage all at once, right? In this case, we just care about the one. So we're going to say, connect to that IP address. Now we can start getting data uh, from this host. To do that, we're going to say, Let's start by getting the indexes. Okay. Client the indices, and it asks for a pattern. In our case, I lied. It's indices.get. By giving a wildcard pattern that says, give me a list of all the indexes currently stored in Elasticsearch. Okay. Now, for every single one of these indexes, going back to our game plan, for every single index that we have, we want to get the fields that are available. Okay, so let's see what one of these looks like. Uh, it was, let's do that. Let me show you what we have here. I have, under my offline data, open up one of our Elasticsearch instances. Let's try this one here. This looks fine. So in this case, uh, this is the data that we that I got back from Elasticsearch offline. Okay, this is the name of the index. Okay, and then inside of here we have a setting called mappings. Okay, and then under mappings we have a list of properties. Each of these properties is those fields. You have this field. Here's the data type. That's what we want to collect today, and we want to log all of that for every single host that we've come across. So let me go back to my scanner. And you'll notice I have a cheat sheet just in case things go really wrong here. So uh, again, I'm not as brave as I may come off. Um, let me go here. So let's say for every index name and the index itself in our indexes, because it's a dictionary, we already have the index name, which is great. Let's explore that index. Uh, for sanity checking, let's do a try and catch block. Trust me, I know where it breaks. <laughs> uh, we'll, just, uh, we'll just continue, that's probably fine. Uh, we want to get our mappings. So I'll say mapping is the index. I get mapping, return a blank dictionary if it doesn't exist because that will break. Uh, and once we have our mapping, we need every single property inside of those properties. So we would say for, I'm trying not to use the cheat sheet, but I really want to go to the cheat sheet. Mm -hmm. Let me do that real quick. I'm going to cheat. Uh, only because it's, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, cool, cool. See, see, perfect, perfect. We're good, we're good, we're good. So I lied. The first thing we're going to get is the number of records per index. Uh, I was checking to see if, if y'all would catch me on that. Uh, it's called, it's called n <laughs> number of records. And we'll say, uh, we'll do client dot, uh, index dot count. And it asks for the index that we care about. We know what index we care about. That's the index name. And now we have the number of records for that index. That's going to be a command to send off, and that's going to hit Elasticsearch and give us back the number of records that are stored in this particular data set. Now we know that there's not just one mapping, but multiple mappings, which is why we're going to get mappings. And then for every mapping name and the mapping itself in our mappings, 
we want to get the fields. Okay, I know there's multiple levels here. It's not my fault. We can all blame Elasticsearch together. Um, but we're going to kind of dive in, and now we're going to get the actual properties themselves. Because here's where we're at. We have the index that says, I have an index named users. Okay, I know that there's the number of records in there. I know, let's say, there's... 20,000 users in there. But I don't know what fields are in there, right? If it's just um, if it's just a random UUID, I wouldn't really care about that. But if I see field names like username, password, I'd probably care a little bit more about that, okay? That's what we're getting now. Getting the properties for the mapping.get properties. Give that blank. And then for every field in our properties, We've done it. We can actually log this. Uh, so I will just say, uh, uh, you know, print the field for now. Uh, okay, disregard the, the linter. All those red underlines is not my errors. They're just opinions from the linter. <laughs> <laughs> So we have it. So now we have the data that we want, presumably, assuming it works. But we want to log it somehow. Okay. So what we'll do is, for now, I'll just catch all this in a little tiny dictionary. I'll return it back, and we'll print it out, and we'll see what comes out. Okay. So I'll just call it a record because this is a valid record. We have our IP address. We have our index name. We have our mapping name. And we have our field name, uh, which let's do this. I want to I want to make this a little bit easier. I'm not going to return every single field on a different line. I'm just going to take all the fields, smush them together as a list, and that'll be a little bit easier to search through. Uh, so instead, I'm going to say the fields is a list of the properties, and we want to convert that to a string. If we're doing that, a little bit of Python. I want to grab those keys. Um, okay, so that actually saves me from having to do this. I grab my record. Great. So now we have a dictionary with our fields, just like that. And we have a record that we could, it, it represents an index, the data types that are in that index, the IP address where that Elasticsearch index is stored, and then we have this data that we could log. The idea is we want a big list of every IP address every index stored there and all the fields that they have. So we can just do, do some grepping, right? Search through, look for things like password, look for things like token, and see what we can come out from there, OK? Is there any questions so far? I want to make sure kind of we're all on the same page. OK, well, I'm assuming we're all on the same page, so we're good. Uh, so let's just return that for now. Uh, let's just uh, let's just yield it. That's fine. Um, so we'll just say yield that record. And I'll say for, uh, now we got to actually call it, I'll say for every instance that we've given, we want to go get that metadata. So I'm going to say uh, for every, whoop, for the, every instance of the metadata in our get indexes, for that instance, and you'll look down here, this is the data that we're working with, uh, IP, we're going to grab that. Uh, it is the key of IP. Uh, we want to print that out. Okay, print the metadata. Okay, so assuming, <laughs> big assumption, that this worked, well, let's see what happens. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I expected it's grumpy at me because of why? My code is perfect. What could possibly be wrong? <laughs> Let's see what happens if we just print it. Worst case, I have the cheat sheet, and we're just going to run the cheat sheet. Hmm. I don't think I don't think that's it. It's claiming that it doesn't like the indentation on thirty six, right? So let's see what's doesn't like that one because it doesn't think that my function is closed, but that's not true. Let's go to our cheat sheet and let's see what we got here. And you'll notice it looks very, very similar. Oh, okay. I think I see the problem. We're not actually catching our accept anymore. That's what it's upset about. Okay. There we go. So if things go wrong, ignore it. You only live once. Uh, <laughs> 
again. It's upset about something else. Indexes, zero, 35. Let's see what we got here. This is what happens whenever you, live, you fly too close to the sun. <laughs> so in the cheat sheet, there are parentheses surrounding the details of the record. Or yeah, okay, so, so we can go and do what I did in the cheat sheet, which is we are building a, a list of the records and we're returning those back to our function and then writing those down as CSV. So we can do that for now. I was going to return them one, one by one, but let's just do that. Uh, let's just step through the cheat sheet here, and if it looks good, then we'll just copy the thing. Um, let's just do that. There's obviously something in here that is correct and beautiful, so we're just going to grab this. We're going to drop this right. I'm missing a space. I'm missing a space? Where did you see that? Uh, mapping name is mapping name. Oh, I think it's a linter. Yeah, it's just grumpy about the space. Uh, it's saying that there's, it's upset about something there. So let's just do this. Let's, let's go ahead and cheat for now because I want to make sure that we're, we have enough time to get through. Um, my confidence will take a hit. And <laughs> so there we go. I dropped it in there. This is actually indices, so I will grab that indices. I'll tell you what, I'm going to keep this, and then after the talk, we can look at through it together. If you find it, find the error, I will buy you a drink or something. <laughs> and then I'll ask you to do the talk next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So let's try to let's try to run this instead and see if this works. Uh, because now we're getting a list of them. We're saying our, all of our records is here, and let's just print the records. There we go. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's just grumpy about my string. Okay, so that whatever bug that is is following us. Why is it following us? Uh, Let's see here. Um, for the items, try. I mean, this. Oh, okay. So it's, it's going to be about the accept again, isn't it? That would do it. All right. Well, let's grab. Let's just put that up there then. It needs it there. Accept and continue. Okay. And let's try to run it again. This is awesome. Oh, okay. Okay. No, that's okay. We're okay. We're okay. That one's easy. I know that. I know this one. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Uh, it worked. Look <laughs> That's okay. You know why? I know. I know the problem. Because <laughs> we got to return it. That would do it. Uh, I gotta actually kill this thing because it's. <laughs> So when in doubt, what we're going to do is I'm just going to like uh, open a new one. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It'll all be fine. Hey, we got data back. All right. Yes. 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 The real purpose of the talk was friendship. <laughs> Helps to show you that, that, that doing this stuff, it's, it's not perfect. Like, like the results that we release, like we're going to give you the polished draft version showing that like everything works. But in reality, uh, things go wrong a lot, like in front of people a lot. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, so we so we have this data back. We don't exactly know what it is, and, uh, and the good news is I also have that offline. Too, so we're just going to look through that. Um, but we have the results that we were looking for. After a little bit of trial and error, we got where we wanted to go. And I'm confident that we're going to cut that out of the video, all the <laughs> things that went wrong. But now let's look at the data that we have, okay? Because we have every single host that has Elasticsearch accessible. We know what indexes they have. We know what, uh, what mappings they have, and then what properties are in each of those indexes. That's a really powerful data set. And you'll notice that we looked at Elasticsearch. We had a big list of databases that have very similar fundamental problems. Misconfigurations, being left exposed. These same techniques apply to each one of those databases. And it applies to each one of those same scanning providers. You could say, hey, I want to look across Census, Shodan, Rapid7, you name it. I want to take all of that information together and look at it much more holistically, using the same exact techniques that we did here today. 
And if you see the headlines that are out there saying this researcher discovered this big finding, this researcher discovered this big, now you kind of know how they did it. It's, it's, if you follow the pieces and you piece those together, you can come up with pretty significant results. Okay? So let's look at our data set. So I made a, like I said, I made a back, backup version uh, to plan for uh, the coding going so well. Um, let's just take a look and see kind of what it looks like. Uh, Elasticsearch instance backup. That's a kind of a boring example. Let's, 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 give, a, let's give a little bit more. Um, there we go, that's a little bit better. So here's what each one of these lines looks like. I know it, it, it may be a hair tougher to see this because I'm trying to keep it relatively uh, concise. We have the IP address. We have the index name. We have the mapping name and then each of the properties in that mapping. Okay, so we could, since each record is just on one line, this gives us the ability just to grep through for whatever it is that we're looking for. Okay, so let's just look at some, uh, some examples. Let's just try password, I guess. Uh, let's see what comes at. Uh, oh, and at the very end, by the way, we have the uh, number of records. So that can help us sort it if we need to. So we're up here and let's see what we have. Uh, let's just take uh, this one here. Uh, here's an IP address, it has a user's index with a name, password, an ID, whether or not they're suspended. It has about 5,100 of those records. That's not a huge data set, but it's sensitive data that might be exposed. We may want to follow up with its owner. We have, uh, here you go, uh, 10 records here that have passwords. We have, um, just scrolling through, this one has some kind of password field and has 3,100 records, 10,000 records here for something that looks like it has, uh, oh, I, there it is, for something that has tokens, passwords, all of this may be sensitive information that we care about. And these are, this is data that's still already out there today. Uh, let's look for, let's do something kind of neat. Let's just grab a bunch of these records again. Because we talk about finding sensitive data, but there's other patterns that may come out whenever we have a data set like this. Because basically what we have is a data set of like what types of data are being exposed on the internet. That's pretty powerful. We don't always have to just look for sensitive data. Okay, let's dump this out and let's see if we see anything that pops out. Uh, hopefully we do. Uh, scrolling through, it looks all kind of standard. And we might see... Well, let me just grab for one then, because I know what it is. Um, how to, that'll work, uh, search instances. There we go. So this something. This is something that whenever I was just scanning through the data set kept popping up over and over and over for every single one of these Elasticsearch instances that I came across. It has a key or a new index called README with a mapping that says how to get my data back. And it has a Bitcoin address. Okay. So this, right? Yeah. yeah. Pretty, pretty clear what's going on here. And, and the <laughs> this is part of the problem. Like not only are we leaving data exposed, we're leaving services exposed. Attackers took advantage of this. So I was studying Redis in a very similar fashion and I noticed that there was a key that kept popping up. It was called crack it. So that's really weird. Like I don't know where this is coming from. So I stood up a honeypot instance and I recorded everything that was happening to it. It turns out what was happening was attackers would hit my Redis instance and it would use a known technique to pretty much save an SSH, SSH private key to the box, and then it had access to log in pretty much as root uh, at that instance, okay? So after we published that, we noticed that the same story started happening to Mongo, to Elasticsearch, and started working its way down these databases, te database technologies where they would wipe the data and then leave a Bitcoin address saying, if you want your data back, you have to pay me this ransom. The trick with the Redis instance was kind of interesting. This isn't part of the talk. This is kind of, this is free. He didn't pay for this. Uh, <laughs> is that they weren't taking the data. They were just deleting it. The thing is, as an administrator, how do I know? That's, that's, the, that's the reality of an incident like this was that that was the, the, the laziest ransomware there is. Like, I'm not even going to worry about like encrypting it, storing it offline and giving it back. Like, I'm just going to delete it. If you give me Bitcoin, great. If you don't, that's fine. You know, it was, I don't have to keep your data, right? And I wouldn't be surprised if something like this was, was similar. I haven't investigated this particular one. Um, 
but we see patterns that come out. And as researchers, we can measure this, report on this, and then help people understand the problem and fix the problem. Okay? It's all about having that visibility, being able to put those pieces together and come out with those actionable solutions uh, that people can act on. Okay? So that's the code. I'm going to post all of the code up on GitHub as well as the slides, as I mentioned, uh, so that you can take this and explore with it, uh, modify it as you need, and hopefully take that research a little bit further. But for now, here are the next steps. Uh, let's say we come across a, a data set where we say it looks like there's usernames and passwords here. That may be an instance where we say, let's look at exactly one record and just get an idea for what, what does this data look like. That's optional. Obviously, that, that blends based on where you want to be. Uh, you know, some people may be uncomfortable with that, even though it's public data. Um, for us personally, I probably wouldn't do that. It's, 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 you know that there's a password field there, and you can let them make the determination if it's sensitive or not. Uh, we could add new data sources. Uh, we could set up daily alerts. We could cache all this information and have our scanner run once a day and just say, here are the new uh, data, databases that I found out there. Uh, obviously, we could alert the owner, and we could create regular reports to the state of the problem. You see some of this. Uh, Binary Edge has done some of this. Shodan's done some of this, where they say, here's the state of open databases on the Internet in 2016, 2017, 2018, seeing these trends over time. And recommending solutions. So we talk about identifying a problem and exploring it, but this is the part that, that I take most seriously, which is how do we fix it? Because there should always be a how do we fix it. If there's not, you're just pointing out something broken. That doesn't really help people, right? So for preventing data leaks specifically, it's all about best practices. There's really no magic sauce here. It's, it's about the problem stemmed from insecure defaults at the beginning. Fortunately, a lot of these are being fixed. So for example, many of these databases, they would listen on every interface and they wouldn't have any authentication by default. And so if you don't go out of your way to change that, your data is exposed. Okay. Now this is getting changed. People are fixing these problems as they come up, which is great to see. It's all about making that progress. Uh, many databases also now support authentication, and in some cases they also support role-based authentication. So that's really useful if you want to not only lock it down, but lock it down per user, per data set. And in some cases you can even go so far as disabling unused features entirely. This is one of the recommendations given by the creator of Redis, where he says, look, if there's certain Redis commands you don't need, you can disable them. You know, least, least privileges, low, lowest attack surface, all that kind of good stuff. Okay. And I also, on the slides, I included a link to the security guides that I found for each of these different databases. So whenever I do publish the slides, if you're using one of these, I recommend taking a glance through it. Again, the goal is to not have you all uh, click on it right now. It's to, uh, to give out the slides where you all can find those later. Uh, and it's, it's interesting, I mentioned Elasticsearch, but one thing we're seeing recently is uh, Cabana, which is a front end to Elasticsearch. It's the dashboard component of it. Uh, we see the case that people will set up authentication on Elasticsearch, authentication to Cabana, but no authentication for Cabana. So you can reach there and not only can you see the data set, you actually have a pretty nice interface. <laughs> right? um, so that's something else, like you have to lock down the whole thing, not just the data store itself. And I've also included links to more tools that do a lot of what we talked about today. So for each of these different types of data, there's tools being written, whoops, published on GitHub, uh, that uh, aim to try to do a lot of it. Hit Shodan, get a list of the results, parse them in some way, shape, or form, and present that back to you. Uh, Leak Looker is one, I haven't used it personally, but it claims to support multiple types of databases all in one tool, which is kind of nice. So it's something you may consider. And to wrap up, Again, the point today was to show that everyone in this room can do really impactful security research. I hope it showed that this problem may seem, like you read these headlines, it may seem like magic at first, like how are they finding this stuff? But if you put the pieces together, it's really straightforward, just with a few syntax errors. You know? <laughs> but the code we wrote, in terms of logic, in terms of the things that we built, I hope it was accessible. I hope it showed that the process from end to end doesn't have to be so incredibly complex, and we have really impactful data sets, really impactful findings that we can go and report on in the future and try to get some of this stuff fixed. And uh, the problem itself, open databases do still exist today, as shown from, from that headline that was yesterday. 
Uh, measuring the problem, though, did give us insight to the issue. But the fundamental goal is always remediation. It's always fixing the problems that we identify. And that's what we can do together as a community uh, here at B-Sides by networking, by going to talks, hearing what people are looking into. Uh, the goal is not to, uh, like I said, the goal with any of this research isn't to end the conversation. It's always to start it. Because it, these kind of things are tackled as a group, as a community, uh, and we can do that together. All right. I'm open for questions. And uh, they have the mic. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, wait for, wait for the mic to come by. Yeah, great. Thank you. Going once, going twice. All right. Thank you, everybody.